You're listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author Sarah Box, where you get the inside scoop on the steps action takers and decision makers take to align their purpose to their principles and achieve their goals in business and life. We focus on the mantra, no labels, no limits, no excuses. Each week, you'll hear from remarkable guests who have overcome challenges and obstacles to succeed in the face of adversity. By listening to their stories, you'll get practical tips, tools, and resources you can implement today to bust through your own internalized prisons of worry and doubt. And now, without further ado, please welcome your commanding coach with plenty of chutzpah and heart, Sarah Box. Welcome to this episode of the No Labels No Limits podcast, a podcast all about helping action takers and decision makers like you align their purpose to their principles and achieve their goals in business and life. Hi, I'm Sarah from Sarah Box Coaching and Consulting. I'm a change agent, former executive director, and best-selling author of The Changemaker Ripple Effect, a book about how one person's drive, purpose, and boldness can impact thousands. And I'm here to tell you that the life you want is possible with the right support, mindset, and strategy. And today's guest is going to actually enlighten us a little bit more on that. So today we're going to talk with Susan Neal. Now, Susan is a nurse. She has a master's in health science. She has a a very interesting background in the health area. But she, on top of that, is also an author, a speaker, She's a certified health and wellness coach and a writer coach. Her award-winning bestseller is Seven Steps to Get Off Sugar and Carbohydrates. Her third book in the Healthy Living series, Healthy Living Journal, won the Golden Scrolls Award 2019 Best Inspirational Gift Book. And her newest release, Solving the Gluten Puzzle, helps many determine if they have a gluten-related disorder and how to treat it if you do. And you can find Susan on Susan U, so Susan, the letter U, Neal, N-E-A-L dot com. In this episode, you're going to hear how Susan overcame a medical crisis at 49 when she actually lost her health, and then how she became passionate about helping others improve their health, weight, and self-being. I think what also is going to be important to learn from Susan is what drove her to publish seven healthy living books. She's going to reveal how you can take something negative that happened and use it to benefit others, how you can reboot your metabolism in seven days, and why boosting metabolism actually matters to long-term health and wellness. So now let's welcome our guest, Susan Neal. Hi, Susan. Hi, Sarah. Thanks so much for having me. Well, I'm glad to have you. I've been looking forward to talking to you for a while, ever since you got scheduled, and it's great to have you on the show. Now, before we dive in, the audience and I want to know one non-negotiable ritual or habit that you do that keeps you heading towards your big vision. Exercise. Exercise is so important. Healthy eating. And I am a yoga instructor. And every week I teach yoga. And it just keeps your spine limber. It keeps your body limber. The meditation portion is wonderful for spiritual connection. And so that's it. That's a pretty strong um, ritual. (laughs) I mean, it it comes with a lot of benefits, a lot of benefits. Well, will you start by talking to us a bit about how you came to the work you're doing today and what the health crisis was that basically upended your life? Yes. So for 49 years, I had really good health. And then I had 10 medical diagnoses and two surgeries, and it all stemmed from an abscessed tooth, but I didn't know the tooth was abscessed. So I had had a uh, a cavity and it had a crown on it, and I didn't realize that the tooth became abscessed until like nine months later. And each month, during that nine months of time or that year, I had like a new medical diagnosis, uh, depression, ovarian cyst, adrenal fatigue, hormonal imbalance. I had a hole in my retina and had to have emergency surgery because 
Uh, holes in your retina is a contributor to blindness. If the retina detaches, uh, I, it was just a mess. It was every single month. It was like something new until I went back to the dentist to have a dental cleaning and they found that I had a, a like a pocket above the tooth and it was abscessed. I had to have an emergency root canal, steroids, antibiotics. I was just a mess following that. And I just didn't even want to get out of bed. I was just so exhausted, low vitamin D, low iron. It was just one thing after another. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to try some alternative care because, you know, the doctors, they gave me the vitamin D, the iron, the adrenal fatigue vitamins. I had the surgery. You know, there wasn't a lot more that they could do for me or offer. So I tried massage, I tried chiropractic, and then I tried a colonic irrigation, which is where you have like a royal enema. And I did that because my bowel habits had changed after I had all those steroids and antibiotics and the root canal and everything. And so I knew something was wrong there. Well, the colonic therapist found out that I had an overgrowth of candida in my colon. And so I took that information to my internal medicine doctor and he did not know how to treat it. So I had to research on my own. What you want to do is um, our, our gastrointestinal tracts were created with the perfect balance of probiotics and, you know, normal uh, bugs that we don't want to overgrow. And when you take an antibiotic, it kills the good guys. But we were never taught to then take a probiotic to re-inoculate uh, the good gut buddies in our, in our gut, our probiotics. So for me, candida overgrew. Candida albicans, it is a yeast. Um, it's the same kind of yeast where someone might get thrush in their mouth or um, a vaginal yeast infection uh, happens after some, you know, sometimes after an antibiotic. So for me, it was, was the colon. And candida loves carbs, sugar, carbs, and alcohol. And I was craving all three. And so I had to figure out how to kill this bad guy in my gut and re-inoculate and re-establish the good bacteria in your gut. So I did. I did. I did an anti-candida cleanse. I did a. Um, I did that in, for like two months. I did a diet, an anti-candida diet, where you. I don't. I don't give it the things it craves: the alcohol, the sugar, the carbs, the refined carbohydrates, the white flour. So, and I starved it for eight months, and I regained my health. And so, like. Five, seven years later, I started writing books, and it was just like, and it just one just led to the other. So, in my book, Seven Steps to Get Off Sugar and Carbohydrates, I uh, take you through my journey, my sister's journey, and, and I want to help others reclaim their health. So, that's the long story of how I got around to be passionate about writing all these healthy living books. Well, so here you are, an educated health professional, right? You are already a nurse. You already had your master's. And I, my point is that it, it isn't necessarily something that even someone trained might n not even recognize that. You know, it wasn't until you went back to your dentist that they said, you've got an abscess, right? So you know what you're looking for or things that kind of make you go, this isn't right, right? So uh, it's it could be hard for other people to even honor their body and what's going on with it to say, this isn't right. So when you starved your body of the stuff that fed the candida, did it take a while for you to feel the difference? Or was that pretty quick that you started to go, I'm starting to feel a little more like who you were or should be feeling? It took eight months. It was long. It was a struggle. 
I would have one good day and three bad days, or I just didn't even want to get out of bed. Two good days and then two bad days. It was back and forth and back and forth. And our bodies will heal if we give them, if we figure out how, you know, what may be causing our problem. It's, you know, it's like when we have a cut, our body heals. So for me, I had to to kill this candida to get my gut health back. And your gut health is really has more to do with your overall health than we ever realized. And the medical establishment is just beginning to figure that out. So, so when you um, started, I'm going eight months into your journey, not the beginning of the journey, but now you've gone through the eight months, you've done your cleanse, you've, you've reestablished some balance in your um, guts. Did you stay off of those foods? Did you reintroduce them? How do you like, how did that come into how you're sustaining your life, your healthy lifestyle now? Well, at first I would, I would try them, but then the next day I had such brain fog and I was so lethargic. It just, so if I ate something that was high sugar or I ate something that contained, you know, like white flour, it just, it wrecked me the next day. And, you know, you just kind of figured this out. So it's like, I'm not going to eat those kinds of foods. I mean, if I do, I might have just, you know, a, a half a slice of, you know, cheesecake or whatever it might be, you know, a half a slice or a quarter, or a third of a slice. So it's a very, very small amount. And so I, I had to cut those things out of my life be, if I wanted clarity of mind and energy. And I valued those things. So I stayed away from sugar. I stayed away. You know, I found other alternatives. There's other alternatives. Monk fruit sweetener, which is like zero on the glycemic index, stevia. So, you know, you can find alternatives and there's all sorts of flowers that are not um, made of wheat that are more whole and organic and better for you. So I, I've maintained that lifestyle. And now you've kind of started a whole new direction at a time where a lot of women are going, okay, that because that's a lot of the folks I work with right there in, in mid to late career, but they're not done. They want to do something different. And here you are writing, you know, and, and prolifically writing and successfully writing. So how did you shift into that? I know you said it was a passion you wanted to share. Had you always written? No, I really hadn't. Uh, but I'd say probably since the time around I got sick, maybe two years later, I started writing and I don't know, it was just like something inside me when it, I just started writing and, and all sorts of different things. So, and I had, I had kept a journal before in my life, but no, I really hadn't. And I, uh, so it was just something new. And at that point, I was in my early 50s and my kids were just starting to get out of, you know, just starting to grow up, leave the house. So I started looking for jobs then, but I had been out of my career for like 20 years. So it was like, okay, so I, I applied to like 40 different jobs. It was a lot. Had a couple of job interviews. No one offered me a job. And it's like, well, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to follow my passion. I want to write. I want to give people guidance and help them understand how they can reclaim their health, how they can improve their health, their weight, their energy, their clarity of mind. So I started writing and lo and behold, my book, Seven Steps to Get Off Sugar and Carbohydrates Right Now is number one on Amazon under healthy diets. That's quite an accomplishment, quite an accomplishment. Will you share a couple of the steps so that folks can get an idea about what they would be in for and why they should actually get the book so they can read it and and You've kind of set the stage for why it's important to do the work. Yes. But what are a couple of the steps? 
Well, number one is to decide. So nobody can make you make a change. You have to decide. So once you do decide, that's the hardest step. Okay. So number one is to decide. Number two is to gain knowledge. Because if you have more knowledge and you understand how different foods are affecting your body, then you're going to make better choices. And when you make better choices, your health is going to be improved. So that is number two. Now, number three, let me pull it out. I think it's cleaning up the pantry. So after you've gained the knowledge, then you need to go to your pantry, your refrigerator, your freezer, and you need to get all the bad stuff out because if it's there, you're going to eat it. You have to figure out what to do with other family members in your home and talking with them about how you want to make these lifestyle changes and if they would please support you and remove those items from the pantry so you don't have to look at them. So, and then the other part of step three is to clean out your emotions. Sometimes people are stress eaters and other times they stuff their anger with food or they have a hole in their heart, unforgiveness, just whatever they have in there that it makes an emotional connection for, from their emotions to food. And that may cause a dysfunctional eating habit. So if that's true, you want to understand that and clean out your emotions. So in this book, what I like to do is get to the root cause of someone who may be overeating or eating in a manner that they don't want to and they want to make a change. Okay, well, was it a candida infection like me? Because I was eating in a manner I didn't want to do. I was eating Ghirardelli chocolate every night. So, and drinking a glass of wine. It's like I, I didn't need that every night. Is it a food addiction or is it an emotional connection? So we get to the root cause because once you overcome that root cause, oh my gosh, it's so much easier to change. It's like once I killed the candida, yeah, it took eight months, but once I killed that guy, my apple tie got back to normal. You know, I, I drink a glass of wine on the weekends, not every single day. I didn't have to have Ghirardelli chocolate, <laughs> you know, maybe once a month instead of every day. So it, it's like your appetite returns back to normal. It's wonderful. Tired of feeling stuck and ending with the same result? Want to know how Sarah can help you with one-on-one -on -one or organizational coaching? Then book your free discovery call at sarahbox.com forward slash contact. Now back to the show. So for someone who, you know, the, when you're saying clean out your, um, the emotions, right? What might be also influencing the food choices, when when you work with folks, do you help them do that or do you refer them to folks to help them do that? I mean, because that's one of those things that can have a lot of um, influences, different causes underneath it. And I'm just wondering if someone's listening to this and they're thinking, yeah, I actually think I need to deal with that. Where, where do they start? Well, I had readers that were just like what you're asking for. So I wrote uh, the second book in this series, and it's called Christian Study Guide for Seven Steps to Get Off Sugar and Carbohydrates, Healthy Eating for Healthy Living with God's Food. And so this delves in to gaining an emotional healing for figuring out how that connection is and for gaining an emotional healing. So I lead them to that resource. How do you, can you define for us what God's food is? I think that's important. I've heard you describe that before, but I think that helps folks understand kind of, um, it's, a, it's right. language. And you know what? 
from from my like when I like for my book and how I tell people the way of eating, et cetera, it's not complicated. You don't you don't count calories, you don't count that's what you do is you look at your food, see if it came from the garden or the ranch. Okay. If if you can look at that and it looks very similar to what it came out of the garden, then that is perfectly fine. So an ear of corn, an organic ear of corn is perfectly fine. But, you know, something, the corn chips, the tortilla chips, those are not, that's processed. You don't want to eat things out of boxes and bags that are processed that do not resemble the food that came out of the garden that God gave us. So that's pretty basic. It's so yeah. basic. It's yeah. easy. It's simple. It's so simple. Well, it's easy to remember. Yes. Right? We might not like what we see, like, oh, but I really think I should rationalize why that potato chip is God's food. Right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And and I did the Bible study in one of the at my church and one of the uh the Christian study guide for the seven steps book. And and one of the people was just like, So I really can't eat my chips. And it's like, how about almonds? How about some pecans? This is the pecan area. Get some fresh, wholesome pecans, you know, pistachios or a green apple and almond butter. So yeah, I think it's funny because we forget there's a piece of it is the convenience of that, right? It's close, you're hungry. And to your point, if it's in the pantry and you're hungry, it's easy. Right? So, um, but I also know, and this is like just from a half an hour ago getting myself lunch, I have fresh fruit on the counter. And then, and then I ask someone, what'd you have for lunch? I'm going, okay, well, I'm having an apple. Could I slice you? An, oh yeah, I'll have an apple. I'm thinking... But you had to walk right by that apple to get what you ate. <laughs> it's been on the counter. So, but I, because that's human nature, right? It's easy. I don't have to do anything for it. Let me just open it. So, but I love what how you described it as, you know, can you recognize it? Did it come out of the ground looking pretty much like this or off the ranch? Is there, now you mentioned, you know, an organic ear of corn. When folks shop, does it matter a lot if they choose organic or you know, is that a filter by which we should shop? Well, the four foods that you most definitely want to uh, purchase organic are wheat, corn, soy, and oats. And the reason why is because those foods, like a large percentage in the United States are currently Roundup Ready crops. In other words, the seed was genetically modified so that it is resistant to the active ingredient of the weed killer, glyphosate. Glyphosate is a carcinogen. And so there have been studies done that have looked at oat products on the grocery store and all of them, 100% that were sampled, contained glyphosate if it was not organic. So you definitely want to buy all wheat products, oats, soy, and corn that are organic. Then the next thing you want to do is you want to look at the resource of the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. And that should be coming out very soon for 2020. It's usually in the spring. So with those, the clean 15, those foods are, um, the fruits and vegetables are listed. You do not need to buy, purchase organic foods for those. But the dirty dozen you do. For example, spinach and kale have been on the dirty dozen last year. So is strawberries. So you do not, you want to make sure those types of food on the dirty dozen are organic. And that goes for even if you're purchasing them frozen as well, correct? Yes, yes. Okay. And is when, when you talk about the dirty dozen, is there a characteristic about those foods that even if I didn't know the list, I might go, well, this could be on that list because of what it looks like, where it's grown or anything like that? I'm not sure what, what you're asking. Well, if I didn't know the list, but I walked away from this listening to this and I thought, well, it's 
it's likely based on how this food is, how it shows up, like how much I have to peel it or prep it, um, it might be safer or it might be okay to eat non-organic versus something I'd look at it. So you talked about strawberries. I'm going, well, they're very um, thin skinned, right? And, and they live where there's, if they're open and there's all kinds of stuff in the areas that strawberries are grown. So I just didn't know if there's like a rule of thumb, I guess is what I'm asking. Right. So it's the thickness of the skin. So an avocado, uh, you, if you didn't know the dirty dozen and clean 15, an avocado is fine. You don't have to buy organic for that. A banana is gassed. So, but it has a thick peel. So maybe you don't buy organic for that. Peaches, you're going to eat the peel. Yes, definitely buy organic. In orange, that's got a really thick peel. Just be sure and wash it real good because that is full of pesticides, but wash it real good. And then you don't need to buy organic. And what do you wash your vegetables with? Uh, like a little little spray and it has some vinegar in it so yes so folks can make their own Mm -hmm. you could you could use just a little vinegar tablespoon of vinegar in your water in the sink in a clean sink that's my fave because i'm thinking i don't have i'm going where is that bottle of vinegar (laughs) it it's a vinegar is a handy thing to have in the house so susan um what is next for you and in terms of your books? So the next thing, my next goal is to create a course for seven steps to get off sugar and carbohydrates because individuals um, want to go deeper and deeper. And I currently have a private Facebook groups and anyone can join. It's called Seven Steps to Get Off Sugar, Carbs, and Gluten. And I get on there. I answer all of your questions. I want to be a resource for my readers. I want to hear your success stories, show your pictures of the food you're cooking. And we all support each other during the tough times too, where we stumble and pick ourselves up. But my next thing is a course for seven steps. And then after that, later this year, I plan on starting my eighth book, which is in my Reclaim Your Health series. And it is going to be Healing Food Sensitivities and Leaky Gut. That's timely. That's really timely. You know, it's only been in the last couple of years, four years maybe, that... um, I've become more and more aware, partly because of family members and then colleagues that I work with who, it's not a joke. I mean, people think, oh, you're, it's a fad to say I want gluten-free. And I'm thinking, you've never watched someone with celiacs get gluten and then like immediately have reaction from it. Um, so could you talk a little bit more about gluten and where it shows up and how people might know or test if they, whether it's an allergy or a sensitivity or what the distinction is between that? Yes, so there are four different types of gluten-related disorder. There's celiac disease, uh, and that is an autoimmune disease. There's gluten sensitivity, wheat sensitivity, and wheat allergy. So for celiac disease, it has over 200 symptoms. For gluten sensitivity, it has over 100 symptoms. And, And most of these are not digestive. They're all sorts of things. And I created a quiz to help individuals. It's called glutenintolerancequiz.com. So I created that to help individuals understand whether they might have a gluten sensitivity or not. And it has all the different symptoms listed for each of the different types of uh, conditions. So when a person, it's it's re- really hard to get diagnosed because prior to 2010, gluten sensitivity was not even a diagnosis. It became a medical diagnosis in 2010. And there is not one single diagnostic test to determine gluten sensitivity, nor is there a single diagnostic test to determine irritable bowel syndrome. Both of those are, let's rule out everything else. So if you've been diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome, 
you could potentially have gluten sensitivity. That's what our uh, GI doc said. He says, when I tell someone they have IBS, he goes, what, that's code for we don't really know what you have. You're showing up. We're, we're trying to figure it out. But it could be a number of things. You know? <laughs> Bec- and, and so my husband said, well, that's interesting. I said, yeah, it, it is. But also I've noticed it's gotten so much better in recent years. But there is a resistance to people thinking that you actually... Ha- there is something wrong, right? And it's like, well, it's all in your head or it's a fad. But is that tied at all? Because when you talked about the um, the wheat, barley, rye, and what, oats, is that tied to um, how those are processed and raised at in all? In reference to the gluten? Well, and to the gluten intolerance or the our uh, reactions to them now, because to, it seems that it's more prevalent than a few decades ago. So I don't know if that's just because it, people are aware of it or because we've wrecked our diets. Okay. So I get, I get into um, that in solving the gluten puzzle. So celiac disease has increased 400% in the past 60 years. Well, in the 1950s, Norman Borlaug won a Nobel uh, prize for hybridizing our wheat in the United States. And then it, it was also, you know, in other countries that they, so what he did is he, is he uh, bred the, the long four feet tall, you know, amber grains of, you know, waving of the wheat with uh, shorter ones and he got it shorter and shorter. And now wheat is like two feet tall, drought resistant and prolific. Unfortunately, the gluten is very difficult for human beings to digest. So it was hybridized to be high production, and that's that's what has occurred. So when 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 you look at medical books and they're like, we don't we don't understand why celiac disease has increased four hundred percent in the past sixty years. Well, that's what I think it's from because this happened in the 1950s. So in the 1960s is when it really started being grown, the hybridized wheat. Now, is that increase in celiac, do you know if it's unique to the States or because since that's how it's here, is that also the same in other countries? I know that's for the United States and I'm not sure about other countries. Thanks, I was just curious. Because I had a, someone came back who is celiac, has celiacs and she traveled, she was in Italy and she said, yeah, I ate pasta. I said, you did, how'd that go for you? And she goes, it went great because it's not like ours. You know, she goes, right. I had no reaction. And I'm, I'm thinking, well, then what the heck? You know, she goes, it was, she goes, now I came back, I'm back on, I don't do it. Exactly. So yes. I've had that same experience. That's a pretty yes. powerful feedback loop. Yes, you know, yes. To like is. when you said you didn't want to feel bad, that's your motivator for staying healthy and eating healthy and making changes as well. Right. So tell us where we can get your books, you know, the best places, because you've got more than one. And then um, talk a little about your metabolism challenge. Okay. So you can find me on Susan U. Neal, N E A L dot com have all sorts of resources for you there. And you can find my books there or on um, in Barnes and Nobles, on Amazon, walmart.com online. So, and your second question was? Talk a little bit about your um, a seven reboot day your challenge. Meta- yeah. Yes, yes. That sounds so, intriguing. Okay. So if you go to my website, the susanuneal.com, if you scroll down on the home page, there is a free gift. It's seven days to reboot your metabolism. And I give you step by step what you do for the first seven days, like drink a lot of water, uh, don't drink sodas, and uh, you can drink your a caffeinated beverage, but stay away from the sugary ones and then take a probiotic, which is something, you know, we may not normally do. And what you do day by day 
to reboot your metabolism, to get it going, to get clarity of mind, energy, and to start a great lifestyle change. Susan, thanks so much. And um, I am actually have some other questions, but I, they start going on and on. So I'm going to hold them and actually do the challenge instead. And I want to thank you for being on the podcast. I think now more than ever, and especially while we're having to kind of lay low and, and take care of our health, the information that you're sharing is really timely and important. So I just want to thank you for doing what you do, for writing, continuing to write, and to help us all be more healthy and ultimately then live a life full of wellness. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author, change agent, and strategic vision coach, Sarah Box. You can grab the show notes and find out how to work with Sarah at sarahbox.com forward slash no labels, no limits podcast. We'd love this podcast to reach as many people as possible. So please remember to rate, leave a five-star review and share the podcast with someone you think would get value from this conversation. Until next time, keep taking those daily action steps to align your purpose to your principles and achieve your goals in business and life.